Welcome to our compost module L5, Urban Planning and Participatory Planning. My name is Uwe Salzmann, I am a geographer and I would appreciate to guide you through our module. The development of cities worldwide has had analogies and differences as well. Antique cities in Greece or Rome, early Mesopotamian, Oriental, Chinese or Central American cities for example, they all were more or less planned. In relation to the objectives of this project, this presentation will be focused on the European point of view. Learning from science fiction cities, scenarios for urban planning. That is the result of a four-month research project by German Federal Institute for Research on Building, Urban Affairs and Special Development, entitled Sci-Fi Cities, Urban Future in Art, Literature and Video. The project examined whether and in what respects works of science fiction can help urban policy identify the potential and risks of future cities. So reading of science fiction books is, seriously, recommended by some urban planners. Fictional scenarios are often about polluted, devastated and unlivable megacities, like for example in books or movies like Dread, The Fifth Element or The Blade Runner. They say this would allow a more free approach of thinking about practical solutions. And in fact, reality is not far removed from that. Take a look at the city of Shenzhen in China. In 1979, Shenzhen had about 30,000 inhabitants, a small and tiny town, so far. Within only 32 years, the population grew by a factor of more than 400 to 12,477,000 in the year 2011. Extreme growth brings along enormous challenges for urban planning. For Shenzhen's development, the most important factor was, probably, economic growth. Let's take a look at Shenzhen today. As far as the horizon, we see a huge amount of skyscrapers. Please switch between slide 4 and 6 to get an imagination about the before and the after. You will see that many questions occur concerning the planning of the new Shenzhen. How about participation? How about sustainability and its three pillars, the ecological, the economical and the social pillar? And the three pillars of sustainability concerning to the planning of the new Shenzhen? We will try to find the answers later. But now, let's switch to the next chapter of our presentation. First we want to give a brief description of the term urban planning and then we will take a look back to the past. Modern urban planning emerged as a profession in the early decades of the 20th century. It was a response to social and economic conditions of rapidly growing industrial cities. Initially, the disciplines of architecture and civil engineering provided the nucleus of concerned professionals. They were joined by public health specialists, economists, sociologists, lawyers and geographers as the complexities of managing cities came to be more fully understood. The following video will give us a brief answer to the question what is urban planning? Please click on the link above. So today, urban planning can be described as a technical and political process concerned with the welfare of people, 
control of the use of land, design of the urban environment, including transportation and communication networks, as well as protection and enhancement of the natural environment. Contemporary urban and regional planning techniques for survey, analysis, design and implementation develop from an interdisciplinary synthesis of these fields. Greek philosopher Hippodamus, who lived in the 5th century BC, was regarded as the first town planner and inventor of the classical orthogonal urban layout. There's evidence from ancient Egypt, among others, that this type of city has been invented long before. The Romans continued this way of town planning, so many European cities of today preserve the remains of these schemes. Take a look at Pompeii, a Roman city of medium size which was destroyed by a volcanic eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79 AD. The shape of the city was well conserved because its ruins were covered by volcanic ashes for hundreds of years. After the fall of the West Roman Empire in the 5th century AD, and the devastation by the invasions of Huns and Germanic peoples, not much of urban culture remained in Europe. It took almost 500 years until a general improvement in the political stability and economy appeared. The cities of the medieval period seem to be less planned because they do not show strong geometric order. In fact, they are also very well planned, but more or less in curved shapes, with a marketplace as well as a church, an abbey, a castle or a fortress in the center. Well-protected examples are found in Europe, like Carcassonne in France or Nördlingen in Germany. Today Nördlingen is one of only three towns in Germany that still has a completely established medieval city wall. Northern Italy was the source of new urban planning in the 14th and 15th century. These Renaissance cities followed again strong geometric orders. Utopias, respective science fiction, by authors like Thomas Morris and Tommaso Campanella, influenced urban planning at that time. Later, new capital and residential cities, like Versailles in France, determined the Baroque. Modern military made city walls useless, the shape changed and the city could widely spread out. In 1602, Campanella described in his Utopia the city of the sun, Italian La Citta del Sol, a city which was protected and defended by seven circles of walls, constructed of palaces that serve as dwellings for the citizens. The city is located in a place with an ideal climate, conducive to physical health and on the slope of a hillside because the air there is lighter and purer. The invention of industrial production was accompanied by a huge rise of the city population. The living conditions declined, rise of pollution diseases and misery. In the middle of the 19th century, Georges Eugène Osman, the prefect of the Seine Department in France, intended to solve these problems in Paris. Large plazas, broad streets, buildings and promenades should change the image of the city. If you take a look at Paris from above, you will see that the shape of the city is still the same. Other planners around the world had been inspired by Osman's ideas. A few years later, in 1862, urban planner James Hobrecht invented a plan for the city of Berlin, which is still characteristic for its shape. Ildefons Cerda 
created a modern Barcelona which looks like a huge checkerboard. Other cities followed, like Bucharest or Buenos Aires. The view of Berlin or Barcelona from above demonstrates the clear and structured planning. In the early 20th century, a counterpart to this stony, concrete and compact way of planning occurred in England. Ebenezer Howard's Garden City Movement. A radial system of medium-sized towns surrounded by lots of green and open spaces should provide a better living. Inspired by the utopian novel Looking Backward and Henry George's work Progress and Poverty and, by the way, here we have got the science fiction again. Howard published his book Tomorrow, A Peaceful Path to the Real Reform in 1898. His idealized garden city would house about 32,000 people on a site of 6,000 acres, planned on a concentric pattern with open spaces, public parks and six radial boulevards extending from the center. The garden city would be self-sufficient and when it reached full population, another garden city would be developed nearby. Howard envisaged a cluster of several garden cities as satellites of a central city of about 58,000 people, linked by road and rail. Based on these ideas, many garden cities have been realized in several European countries. In 1922, famous architect Le Corbusier, by the way, his real name was Charles Edouard Jeanneret Gris, designed his idea of a ville contemporaire. Huge living towers should be the answer to traditional urban planning. Gigantic buildings and complexes have also been characteristic for totalitarian regimes. Especially fascism preferred these gigantic buildings in an antique style and geometric order. Adolf Hitler and his architect Albert Speer planned a new Berlin called Germania. It should be the capital of a Nazi world with a 300 meter high dome in its center. Socialistic or Stalinistic planning was not far removed from these ideas. Big palaces for workers should be built to show the benefits of communism. The Stalin Alley in Berlin was completed in the 1950s and provided spacious flats. Post-war time required a fast rebuilding of destroyed cities within Europe. Two major developments have to be mentioned. First, increasing motorization created a new type of cities, suburbia, predominant in Western societies because the availability of private cars was much bigger there than in the countries of the Warsaw Treaty. Second, social housing. This was meant to reduce social grievances in both Eastern and Western societies. But it often had exactly the opposite effect. Today, we will find the most social flashpoints in these buildings and complexes. So now we are at the end of the first lecture. To provide further insights of this topic, please click the button below and read The History of Urban Planning.